we all have that person in our lives. I'm sure if you like close your eyes, you can all picture this, this person. That person that knows how to work a room, right? That person that's connected to everybody. They're always name dropping everybody. That person that never had to interview for a job, but just suddenly got all these offers. You know what I'm thinking about? The person that uh, knows exactly how to give an elevator pitch. That person that knows how to win friends and influence people. That person that can name drop anybody. That person that never eats alone. That person that could introduce you to anybody if you could just meet them. Don't you just hate that person? <laughs> I, mean, th I mean, seriously. Like, you, don't, I mean, you don't hate that person, but you could admit it. You kind of hate them. Because every time you try and do that, everybody, every time somebody tells you it's, you need to work your network, you need to get out there and introduce yourself, you need to meet people, every time you go to one of those things where you know that's what you're supposed to be doing, your mouth gets all cotton mouth, you say the wrong thing, you, or you end up like sitting in the back corner with somebody you already knew and you're just counting down the minutes until it's time to go, right? You know that like networking and connections are important in your life. But every time you try and do it, you just feel like that weirdo sleaze bag pushing business cards in everyone's hand and trying to get everybody to call you back. And so the, the people that are like really good at it, admit it, we, we kind of hate you if you're good at that. I'm there with you, right? This is a safe space, you can admit it. I'm right there with you. I don't really like that either. It doesn't come all that easily to me. I'm certainly not an introvert, but I'm still a little weird in those situations. And that's why I was so surprised uh, to find out about a guy named Adam Rifkin. You probably never heard the name Adam Rifkin. If you did, you're probably thinking about the one who works in Hollywood. It's not the Adam Rifkin that I'm talking about. Adam Rifkin is the world's greatest networker. The world's greatest networker. That's not me saying that. That's Fortune magazine. Fortune compiles all these lists of the top 400 awesome people, the 100 most influential people, 40 under 40, all of these things. And, they decided to do an experiment one time to look at everyone on LinkedIn and see who was most connected to the most people on all of their lists of influential people. And it wasn't Zuckerberg, it wasn't Reid Hoffman, it wasn't Elon Musk, it wasn't anybody you'd think it was. It was this guy named Adam Rifkin, the world's greatest networker, connected to the world's most influential people. And it's true, Adam works in Silicon Valley and he has had no problem getting startups funded. At one point, he needed office space for a startup, and so he called up a friend of his and ended up borrowing a floor at LinkedIn's headquarters until they needed it just for his. Right, Adam can send emails cold to random people, and they respond within a few hours because of who he is and who he's connected to. So that made me, if you're, if you're like me, you immediately think, I want to meet this guy. Because the other thing about Adam Rifkin is he looks different. Right? He's not like the tall, slick back hair, perfect three-piece suit networker that we all think of. He's kind of shy, kind of introverted, a little heavy, wears a hoodie most of the time. In fact, he kind of looks, well, he looks like a panda bear. <laughs> Adam Rifkin looks like a panda bear. And he's okay with me saying that because it's a sort of a moniker that he champions, right? But he's the world's greatest networker, even though when I reached out to him and asked for an interview, the first thing he said to me was, I don't really network anymore, which I thought is a really curious thing for the world's greatest networker to say. And so as I started digging into it, I found out that Adam has a PhD in computer science and his entire approach to people has been influenced by computers. And you might think that's a bad thing, but in this case, it kind of works. As he studies how computer networks work and how the internet works and how different computers and servers are connected to each other, he's studying networks. And he came upon the realization that the same rules that apply to computer networks apply to human networks. Who's connected to whom and why. And thus began his process. And he doesn't go to all of these networking mixers, but what he does is he tries to increase the number of connections of people he already knows. He's constantly writing introductions because he knows that one of the rules of computer networks is that it gets stronger the more links people have to each other. The network, the community is stronger when more people know each other. 
Right? The other thing that he does is he realizes that he can't be the center of it. He's deliberately not trying to be that weirdo business card pusher guy that knows everybody. He's trying to make himself redundant by cultivating this community of people in his industry. And so he started this community called 106 Miles. There are several chapters of it now in and around the California area. It's all tech and startup entrepreneurs who need the benefit of knowing each other. So he figured out that the best the way to be the world's best networker was to take care of the network. And that was a really interesting lesson for me. So for the last several years, I've been looking at what can we learn from the science of how networks work, how people are connected to each other. What can we learn about what that means for your own ability to make professional connections, to network, to strengthen those relationships, to get what sociologists call social capital, the value inherent in the connections that you have and the connections that they have for you. See, this is the thing that I think is interesting that Adam Rifkin figured out. So we know that if we try and do this networking thing, we all feel like cotton-mouthed and a little weird. And in fact, in one study, people literally felt dirty. Like they asked people to recall a time where there were professional connections, where, where you were making professional connections, and then they gave people a test of uh, to judge their subconscious. And what they found was that people rated words like soap and wash and shower more favorably than other words, a subconscious trigger that they felt dirty. Networking literally makes people want to take a shower, and yet then we have this other thing. We have this guy who looks like a panda bear, and he turns out to be the world's best networker. So what if, what if paying attention to the network around you is everything you need to know about how to network and make professional connections? That's the lesson of Adam Rifkin. That's the lesson that I've been studying for a while now. And so I want to share with you a few of those insights around what knowing how networks work can teach you about how to operate. And it looks a little bit different. And I can't promise you that you're going to turn into the world's best networker. I can teach you how to look like a panda bear if you want. <laughs> But I can promise you that through applying these lessons and learning how networks work, you're going to have a very different perspective about networking. What if it's not about meeting total strangers? What if it's actually just about understanding who is a friend, who is a friend of a friend, and how do you make more friends? So with that said, let's talk about one of the first things, potentially the most powerful thing that you can do to grow and expand your network and increase the value of social capital. And that is actually not meeting new people at all. It's reconnecting to your, what sociologists call, weak ties or dormant ties. These are people who have been in your life that were previously fairly strong ties, that were friends or colleagues, etc. but for some reason or another, you fell out of contact with them. And for the last 50 years, study after study shows that you're more likely to find out about job opportunities, to find new information that changes your perspective, to think the sort of like big ideas that people start high, highly valued companies with. You're more likely to earn new sources of revenue, new sales, et cetera, just by understanding and reconnecting with your weak and dormant ties. One of my favorite studies on this is one of the original studies. It's actually titled a Strength, The Strength of Weak Ties. It's by a man named Mark Granovetter. And what he found was that people, uh, he categorized everyone's connections into close, meaning you would talk once a week, uh, kind of mid-range, so maybe every month or so, and then out to two or three years. And what he found was that 52% of people who were on the job market found it through that, through the more than a year since we last talked. What's curious about it is that almost everyone would say, well, it wasn't a friend of mine, and it wasn't a colleague, it was like a, it was an acquaintance, right? So we began to dig into what's going on, why is that happening? And the thing is, networks aren't built sort of equally. They're not evenly distributed. They don't work like a perfect grid. They have nooks and crannies. People cluster together, right? As you interact with certain people, your network kind of closes around those, and you have your close friends. And eventually, you spend enough time with just those close friends, you all have access to the same information. You all think the same way. You're all looking at the world in a certain perspective. And the people who are way over on the other side of your network are running around in a different circle, a different cluster, because you haven't interacted with them. 
right? And that, that bridging between these two sort of clusters is what uh, a lot of people refer to as a structural hole or a broker between a structural hole in the network. And you're creating new opportunities just because these people over here, who your weak tie could introduce you to, who your weak tie has been learning from and seeing the world from, can offer you a different perspective than what you're used to. And the beautiful thing about weak and dormant ties is you don't have to establish from scratch this whole new relationship. You were already connected with them. You just have to reconnect. My absolute favorite example of this, this is a weird question to ask. Is anyone a fan of the UFC? Anybody? Mostly the males in the room, a couple females. Anyone a fan of Conor McGregor? Right? George St. Pierre is coming back. This is good news, right? The UFC, mixed martial arts as a whole, is a sport that almost didn't exist. It existed, it went bankrupt, and then two guys saved it. Those two guys were Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta. And the interesting thing about Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta is that they were not business partners. They barely even knew each other when they saved the UFC. Actually, that's not entirely true. They were weak ties. They were a dormant connection. See, they went to high school together. They went to high school together in Las Vegas. Dana White actually got kicked out of that high school, which is the ultimate way to turn somebody into a weak tie, kick them out of the high school that you were interacting with them with. And he, he moved off, went into New England, worked in this whole um, area around gyms and boxing, and eventually MMA became an agent for some of the first, I won't call them superstars, because in a sport that's bordering on the brink of bankruptcy, no one's really a superstar. But some of the first notable names he was an agent for. And then he goes back to Las Vegas and he goes to a high school friend's wedding. And across the buffet table from him is Lorenzo Fertitta. And they reconnect and, oh, I haven't seen you in like 10 years. What are you up to? And they find out, I mean, Lorenzo, if you don't know, is the heir to a casino gambling fortune who also happened to be a commissioner in the Nevada State Athletic Commission, the group that regulates prize fighting. They reconnect because they both share this kind of interest in this esoteric, virtually banned sport called mixed martial arts. And then they, they do what most of us do when we reconnect with a weak tie. They go, hey, this was fun. We should do it again sometime soon. And then, of course, what most people do is they never talk to that person ever again until the next person gets married. Or maybe the same person. Just kind of depends. Right? But that's not what Dana White did. About two months later, Dana White finds out that the UFC is going bankrupt. And so he calls up Lorenzo Fertitta and he says, hey, I think the UFC is for sale and I think you should buy it. So Lorenzo, along with his brother Frank, decide to purchase the UFC from the original owners. They give Dana White a 10% stake in the company in exchange for sort of being the president. This is actually the most interesting point of this whole story. The two brothers decide to jointly share the company and Dana White has a 10% stake, so 45, 45, 10. And the lawyers are furious because what are you going to do in a dispute, right? If both of the brothers disagree and Dana White can't decide, what are you going to do? So they wrote into the incorporation papers of the new company that if the two brothers ever disagree, to settle their disagreement, they will engage in a jiu-jitsu match of which Dana White will be the referee. <laughs> It never happened, unfortunately, but it's a pretty cool way to structure for a legal dispute. So the Fertitta brothers and Dana White begin the process of reinvesting and reinvigorating this brand. And a year ago, they sold the company for $4 billion. $4 billion. Right? At the time, Lorenzo referred to it as the biggest deal in the history of sports, which is true because the highest uh, sports franchise had ever gone to up to that point was $2 billion. To give you an idea, Disney bought Lucasfilm and all of the Star Wars property for $4 billion. The Fertitta brothers created the same amount of value in a third of the time because one guy reconnected with another guy at a wedding. Pretty cool lesson, right? Now, obviously, you can't just start running off to random people's weddings and hoping you meet all sorts of old friends, right? That's, that's not the lesson. But there is a takeaway for every single person, which is there are people in your life who you don't interact with very much anymore. And that's a good thing because those people are interacting with people who think differently than you, who work in different industries than you, who are aware of other opportunities than you. And by reconnecting with those people, you might not make $390 million by most people's estimates of what Dana White made, but you'll have more social capital and that will eventually turn into real capital and real opportunities, et cetera. So my takeaway for most people from this is make a list. 
right? Think about five to ten people who you have talked to. It has been more than a year since the last time you connected with them. And then make a point once a week, once a day, etc., to reach back out to them. Send them an email, a phone call, a text message. Ping them on Facebook. Whatever you want to do, right? To just say, hey, let's catch up. Let's reconnect. The second is figure out who is a friend of a friend. One of the most amazing things, the most amazing mindset shifts that you can undergo is that you don't have a network. You don't network. It's not something you do. It's not something you have. We all exist inside of a network. 7.4 billion people strong and counting. We all exist inside of one network. And most of the people in that network are within five or six degrees of separation from you. I mean, you've probably heard of the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Some of you are like, I don't even know who Kevin Bacon is, but apparently he's famous. He's not actually famous. The interesting thing is he's not even like the most connected man in Hollywood. He's just an actor that people became fascinated with the fact that he'd been in so many different movies with so many different people and that you could link basically anyone in Hollywood to anyone else through Kevin Bacon. But the truth is you can actually link anyone in Hollywood to anyone else through anyone because we're all one big network, 7.4 billion people strong and counting. And one of your second biggest, after weak ties, sources of opportunity are the people that are one degree of separation from you, the friend of a friend. These are the people who are like a weak tie, running in a totally different circle, but unlike a weak tie, you're going to need an introduction for because they're a little bit further. There's more of a bridge to build, and when there's more of a bridge to build, there's more of an opportunity. My favorite example of this is is one you've probably never heard of her, but she's an amazing executive and an amazing woman, Michelle McKenna Doyle. Michelle McKenna Doyle was raised in Alabama and raised loving football. All of her brothers actually played football at the University of Alabama. Uh, Her dad actually would often joke that, you know, one of my kids one day is going to work for the NFL. And Michelle was a little bit different. Uh, She broke her dad's heart. She went to Auburn. She graduated, she worked in the sports program, but obviously you know, it's not like she tried out for the team, right? But she worked in the athletics program and later she began to work inside of technology. She worked for Disney, she worked for Universal Studios. She be- eventually became a chief information officer for a major Fortune 500 company. And then one day, because she still loves football, she is still her daddy's little girl, she was checking her fantasy football stats. And at the very bottom of the NFL website was a little tab that said careers. So she clicks on it, she looks through all of these different jobs, and she reads a description that sounds an awful lot like the job she's doing now. But it didn't have the pay level of a CIO, and it didn't have uh, the the title of CIO. So she just kind of thought, like, that's weird, they need me, but they don't know they need me. And I also don't know anyone at the NFL. So let me get back to manning my stats. And a couple days later, a friend of hers sends an email and says, hey, I found this on the NFL website, and it sounds like you. So now she's thinking, okay, well, that's two, so maybe there's something to this. But I don't know anyone at the NFL, so how am I going to meet somebody and simultaneously convince them that actually what they need is a chief information officer role and a bigger salary, right? But she's smart, so she starts to work her network. She starts to look at her weak ties, starts to look for friend of a friend. What she finds is that when she worked previously in technology for the Walt Disney Company, one of her colleagues left and joined a headhunting firm. So she calls him up and she says, hey, do you you know who's manning this search? Do you know who's in charge of finding candidates for this search? And he says, you know, my firm's not representing them at all, but I know a guy who works for the firm that is. Let me make a phone call. So if you're keeping track, she reaches out to a weak tie, an old friend. The old friend says, hey, I'm not actually doing anything here, but I have a friend of a friend who is. That friend of a friend puts her in front of the NFL. She has to convince the commissioner that not only is she qualified for the job, but they don't understand how qualified she is, and they need to make it a CIO position. And it works. She became the highest level executive ever to be hired in the NFL. And one kid from her family finally made it to the NFL, although not in the way her dad expected, right? All because she began to work the fringes of her network, that six degrees of separation thing. So, Now, I don't know if anybody here wants to work for the NFL one day or anybody wants to even begin to work the weak ties, but there's a takeaway that almost everybody can apply. And it has to do with this. The way that we meet people is 
is kind of broken. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But one of the reasons for that is that when we meet people, we do one of two things. We either immediately filter through whether they can help us right now. Right? And then we kind of like filter them out or filter them in based on whether or not we see an immediate need. Or we think about who they could introduce us to. And most people, when put on the spot that says, hey, can you introduce me to the commissioner of the NFL, don't want to introduce you to the commissioner of the NFL. Right? Most people want to be able to opt into that. So when you're exploring the fringes of the network, don't like, look people up and see that you have a mutual friend and therefore you're going to beg that person for introduction. Really make an exploratory job of it. Begin to ask multiple people, hey, who do you know in blank? Blank being whatever industry, whatever sector that you want to make an impact in. Whoever you need to be connected to. Who do you know in blank? This does a couple things. It lets you know who really is at the fringes of your network. Who's really one degree of separation from you. But the other thing that it does is it lets the other person opt in to introducing you. And when they do that, they're more enthusiastic to make the connection. They're going to be your champion more than if you're begging them to introduce you to that one person. You get bonus points, too, if, what you, if you find out that you're exploring the edges of your network, you're asking multiple people, who do you know in, and they all say the same name. Because now you've got this sort of surround sound thing going on where they're all saying, you've got to meet this person, one degree of separation, where you've got to, let me introduce you to my friend. It'll work far better for you. So don't ask people sort of what they do or who they can introduce you to. It's just a simple open-ended question to help you explore the edges of your network. Who do you know in blank? Blank being wherever you want to go. So if you're keeping track, we have a couple things. We have reconnecting with your dormant or weak ties, your old friends. We have knowing who's one degree of separation away from you, who is your friend of a friend. And then the last thing I'm going to advise you to do from the, the science of networks is to make work contacts into actual friends. In social science, they use a terrible word for this. They refer to it as multiplexity, a, which no iPhone autocorrect has ever allowed me to spell properly. So Siri thinks that this isn't a word. But multiplexity refers to how many ties of connection there are between you and me. Right? So a single, hey, we used to work together, that's a uniplex tie. And a multiplex tie would be, we used to work together, but we also volunteered at this program, and we also went to church, and her sister's brother is my uncle. Which, actually, family tree-wise, I don't think that works. I have no idea. I'd have to sketch that out. But a multiplex tie, it's not like a, you're sketching it out. It's okay. You don't have to. A multiplex tie is one where you have these multiple connections, and the research says that you make deeper and richer connections with people when you have a multiplex tie, right? when you have multiple things connecting the two of you. Now, I, I blame the godfather for the whole idea of like it's not personal, it's just business, but the truth is, as long as business is done from human to human, one day there might be robots interacting with robots, but as long as business is being done from human to human, it's always going to be personal. So break out of your mind that there are work contacts and then there are your real friends and try and make a deeper and richer connection with almost everybody. The, the pinnacle person for me for this, the person I've found in my research that is the absolute definition of multiplexity is a man named John Levy. John Levy, you probably never heard of him, but John Levy, in my opinion, throws the best dinner parties in the world. And not for the reasons you'd think. See, if you show up to John Levy's house for dinner, the first thing that he's going to tell you is that you're cooking. And he's going to give you a list of tasks that everybody who's invited to the dinner has to do to cook dinner together. And the other thing he's going to tell you is that you can't use your name. You're not allowed to say who you are or what you do. Not until everybody sits down for dinner. But during the cooking, you have to just leave it open-ended. Nobody shares their identity. Right? And they cook together, they eventually sit down and eat together, and then they start to play a guessing game where they guess what everybody does. Now, if this sounds like a combination of like dinner party and murder mystery, it kind of is. <laughs> right? But it works, and it works for a really interesting reason. I mean, most of us, as I said earlier, ask the dumbest questions when we are interacting with work people. Right? So like, think about the entire course of your life. You were probably, when you were young, you were asked, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? You remember those? Right? I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. They want to be a builder and a policeman. There's only like five professions they're aware about, but two of them are that, right? 
And then, you know, you, you go to college and people say, what's your major? Well, what do you want to do with that? Which is just another version of what do you want to do when you grow up? And it doesn't get any better from there. Now you're meeting people in a professional context for the first time, and the questions are, who are you and what do you do? But that doesn't help people build multiplex ties. What it helps people do is stick to a script, stick to a rigid, carefully massaged, perfectly worded version of themselves. And as a result, you can never build that multiplex tie. So John says, no, we're not going to do that at my dinners. What we're going to do is make connections based on the activities that we love, the passions that we share, the TV shows that we watch, the childhood experiences that we have, all of those things that make for deeper, richer connections. And then we're all going to sit down to dinner, and we're going to find out that she's royalty, that he's a famous comedian, that he's a television executive, and that this guy's a scientist that works for NASA. It's incredible. The people that John's had in his home since he began to throw these dinners has gotten more influential and more influential and more influential. In fact, John actually refers to his dinners as the influencer's dinner. It's not the most creative title for a dinner ever, but it does tell you exactly who's going to be there. But the rule is you have to make a connection with those influential people for a reason other than work, other than a professional contact, other than opportunity. And as a result, people make deeper and richer connections because of it. Now, all right, I know what you're thinking, like, okay, there's no possible way I could throw a dinner party for royalty. Well, John didn't either. When John started, it was just him and his friends, most of whom knew each other, but some of whom didn't. And it wasn't until they started referring people to his awesome dinner parties that the list grew more influential and that people started trying to one-up each other with their perfect script of who am I and what do I do? And that's when he institutes the rules. He says, no, forget about that. We're going to focus on meeting each other and building dip, deeper and richer connections. And because of that, the list grew more influential and more influential. As more people said, you've got to go to this dinner. I know you've never heard of this John Levy guy, but you've got to go to the dinner at his house. I'll refer you. And as people started to refer their friends and friends of friends to John, the list of influential people grew. And to say that it's had an effect on John's career is like the understatement of the night, right? Because... It obviously has. You can't have that in, those influential people in your life and not have amazing opportunities that come about. So John's got an amazing consultant work, speaking opportunities, a book deal, all sorts of things. But what he'll tell you is that those connections have allowed him to have deeper and richer relationships with people that have provided some of the best experiences in his life, and that's what he really treasures. And I think there's something to that that trying to connect with somebody on a person-to-person -person level through multiplex ties, through multiple things ends up giving you more opportunities, but at the same time makes you not think about those opportunities because what you think about is that relationship. It makes sense. And in fact, I think that to some extent is the takeaway, right? So as I said earlier, we're terrible at asking questions when we meet new people because we either ask the what do you want to be when you grow up, what are you trying to be, or who are you and what do you do questions. So don't ask those. When you meet somebody for the first time, ask them something that would connect on a multiplex level. Ask them something that would connect deeper and richer. Ask them a question like, hey, what excites you right now in your life? Right? Or ask them a question like, hey, what are you from? Or my favorite, like, what TV show from the 90s is the consistently the best show ever? And of, of course, everyone's going to say Seinfeld, but that's a different issue. Right? The point is, a question like, what excites you right now? Invite someone to drop their script, to drop their perfectly designed elevator pitch and to tell you what they actually care about. And then you begin to develop what a lot of researchers refer to as uncommon commonalities, things that you and that person share that no one else in the room shares. When you do that, you have a deeper and richer relationship. When you do that, you're more likely to follow up with that person. And again, the opportunities that come away from that are better because the relationship is deeper, the social capital is more valuable. So don't ask who are you and what do you do, right? Ask what excites you right now. Okay, so we've got a couple different takeaways. So to review, they all end up in the context of not thinking about the network, but just thinking about friends. Reconnecting with old friends, right? Figuring out who is a friend of a friend. And then trying to make professional contacts into friends. All of those things will have a more lasting impact on your professional network, your professional opportunities, your social capital than anything else, any other advice that you've heard. Because not only are those things steeped in research on how networks work, they're guided by examples of people like Adam Rifkin, who looks like a panda bear but is the greatest networker in the world. 
Right? Or Michelle McKenna Doyle, who was the highest, uh, highest paid and highest level executive for the NFL when she started. Right? Or John Levy, who throws the greatest dinner parties in the world with the most influential people in the world who aren't allowed to tell you how influential they are. Reconnect with old friends. Figure out who is a friend of a friend. And then turn professional contacts into friends. But there's another reason that this advice works. There's another reason that this is so important. At some point in your life, uh, you probably heard the phrase, you know, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You've heard this, right? Or, or you're the average of the five people you interact with most. There's a bunch of variations on this advice. And the idea is that your friends affect you. Your friends affect your outcome, right? And that your friends are your future. So choose your friends wisely. Well, it's true. It's backed by research, but it's actually more true than you would suspect. See, two researchers, about 10 years ago, two researchers, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler, began to construct one of the largest models of a social network ever. They used data from this thing called the Framingham Heart Study, which uh, in health sciences is one of the longest running and largest, in terms of participants, health study ever. It spans multiple generations, tens of thousands of patients. And what they did was they used data from all of those patients to construct a network of who was connected to who, who was a, a friend and friend of a friend, and all of that sort of stuff. And what they found was that people really did have an effect on each other's health. Uh, the, probably the, the media reports from the first study they ever published, probably the best summary of it, they found that your friends make you fat. <laughs> it's true. Your friends actually have an influence on your chances of becoming obese. If you have a lot of obese friends, then you're more likely. But the interesting thing is that your friends of friends do too. Even if you've never met them. And your friends of friends of friends also influence your body mass. And then they began to look at other factors. So they looked at uh, smoking. You're more likely to smoke if your friends smoke, but you're more likely to smoke or to stop smoking if your friends of friends smoke or your friends of friends of friends. They started to call it the three degrees of influence. And it's been replicated in almost every aspect of health and in a few you wouldn't suspect. So for example, happiness. If most of your friends are happy, you're more likely to be happy with life. But if most of your friends of friends are happy, you're also more likely. And even out three degrees to friends of friends of friends, it's a 6% increase in your likelihood of being happy. Now you might think like, oh, 6%, that's like barely anything. But figure this, if I gave you a $10,000 raise, that would only increase your happiness 2%. So three times the effect on your happiness from someone three degrees of separation out whom you've never met. And that's why this is so important. That's why this is such a different approach to networking. It's not the act of networking. It's not the collection of networking. It's understanding how networks work because not only are your friends your future, your friend of a friend is your future. Your friends of friends of friends are your future. So choose them all wisely. Thank you all so much for having me.